And today um, we have Brian Worley with us. Uh, he is with PYA Analytics. He came here from Knoxville, Tennessee, so he flew to, to do this talk for us, and we really appreciate it. Brian brings 35 years of scientific leadership experience to his role at PYA Analytics. For the past 11 years at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Brian developed and directed the most prestigious science agenda within the U.S. Department of Energy and National Laboratory System devoted to knowledge discovery from disparate and dynamic data. His division staff include 170 research scientists and engineers and another 100 associated staff from academia and private industry and subcontractors. The research and development spanned the broad areas of data systems, data analytics, predictive analytics, and cybersecurity. As a national lab with national mission scope, the applications included national security, energy assurance, and most recently, national healthcare challenges. For the past two years, Brian has overseen a strategic collaborative between the ORNL and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to develop and prototype the knowledge discovery infrastructure to address the current and future data, big data needs of the national healthcare systems, including aligning not only claims data across the national Medicare system and state's Medicaid systems, but also to include the data from the Veterans Administration, Social Security, and others. Most recently, Brian has been instrumental in standing up a Health Data Science Institute at ORNL, the vision of which is to provide a computational infrastructure and big data services to support national and international research thrust via development of topical centers within the institute. The overreaching institute theme is data drivers, data driven health, and medical research. Brian currently serves on the advisory board of the institute. Prior to devoting his research and management interest toward knowledge discovery and big data, Brian led the ORNL computational sciences section in the application of high performance computing to basic and applied sciences and was group leader for the reactor physics group. Brian was trained as a nuclear engineer and earned a PhD degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. I went to Boy Scout camp too. So. <laughs> Can you hear this? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Cell phone out. Can you hear me? Um, okay, I'm going to walk over this way. There, there's about three people in the other room, and all, all the everybody else here. Okay. Um, so I uh, appreciate the offer to come and talk today. Um, I'm going to try to uh, address um, a little bit of the transition of what. Um, data analytics has been uh, uh, doing in areas that I've been associated with in, in national missions and national security and, and energy, and then make a transition into some of the um, medical uh, and health applications. So <clears throat> I guess this, this yep. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about big data science in general, uh, some of the health data uh, freeing up the health data that's becoming available to us, and then talk about uh, some specifics for healthcare analytics, and some of which I'm sure you're well aware of. But first, um, I'm going to measure your nerd factor. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you a little uh, trivia quiz on computational scientists. And if you score about zero to ten percent, you're just a normal, happy person. Okay? <laughs> you score about ten to thirty. You probably belong to him. <laughs> uh, if anything over 30 to 40 percent, uh, you are a nerd. And if you score 100 percent, you're probably drinking Coke and eating a candy bar in a basement somewhere, as accessing this somehow. Okay, so <laughs> no. all right. So here it is. Uh, this is a who said type of quiz. Who said the internet? We're not interested in it. No, you don't have to answer. I'll just tell you. Um, Bill Gates, okay? All right. Uh, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Uh, Thomas Watson, founder of IBM. Okay. That's why Microsoft passed. Uh, 
Al Gore, if Al Gore invented the internet, I invented spell check. <laughs> now, you know this one. I know you know this. That's Dan Quayle. <laughs> right. uh, I see no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Uh, Ken Olson, founder of Digital Equipment, now out of business. Right? <coughs> um, man is still the most extraordinary computer of all. Um, John F. Kennedy. Has anybody scored anything greater than 100, uh, zero so far? <laughs> uh, to create a new standard, it takes something that's not just a little bit different. It takes something that's really new and really captures people's imagination. And the Macintosh, of all the machines I've ever seen, is the only one that beats that standard. Bill Gates, <laughs> actually. That's another story. <laughs> He's a nerd, <laughs> you can tell. All right, be conservative in what you do, be liberal in what you accept from others. Uh, John Postel, and if you don't know who he is, that's probably worth looking up. Um, it would appear that we have reached the limits of what is possible to achieve with computer technology, although one should be careful with such statements as they tend to sound pretty silly in five years. Of course, that's, we know that's not true. But it was spoken by uh, John von Neumann, who uh, is credited with uh, inventing the computers for most, by most people. No, I'm not interested in developing a powerful brain. All I'm after is just a mediocre brain, brain. something like the president of AT&T, right? <laughs> okay, uh, Alan Turing. And uh, if you don't know what the Turing machine is, you might go on Wikipedia and, and read, it, read about it. And you might read his biography which, uh, on the Wikipedia, which is uh, very interesting, actually. Um, the question of whether computers can think is just like the question of whether submarines can swim. Um, and that was uh, another famous computer scientist you may want to look up someday. That's it. So um, we'll go on. So I'm going to start talking about uh, big data. And if you think about the history of the way things were discovered, it pretty much follows this kind of um, spectrum. Thousands of years ago, think experiments uh, were the only way people were making discoveries. They looked to see what happened to the stars at night, and then uh, they started building mathematical models. Uh, about a hundred, few hundred years ago, computers became a primary source of uh, discovery in the last 20 or 30 years. But in the last five or 10, um, data is becoming uh, viewed as its own source of knowledge. And in fact, a few years ago, there was an article in the um, New York Times that was repeated from Wired Magazine, I think, about you know, the end of science. If we could just, there's so much data, we could just empiricize everything and uh, we can predict what's gonna happen. It doesn't matter what the underlying models are. So, so uh, that's, that's an extreme example or ex extreme viewpoint, but it uh, makes the point that there is so much data and it is accessible to us that it's produced a new way of, of making discoveries. And if you think about it, this is uh, taken from a national lab standpoint where they have a lot of experiments and simulations and archives and social media and, and sensors. Uh, all this data is, is, uh, uh, needs to be combined to get the full value out of any part of the data. And a year and a half ago, uh, the worldwide um, amount of data being generated uh, surpassed the zettabyte for, for the first time. And about six months to a year ago, the amount of sensor data surpassed, being generated surpassed the amount of social media data. And which is kind of interesting when you consider there's an entire movie being uploaded to YouTube about every 30 seconds. But uh, there's only so many humans in the world that can actually upload, and sensors are, can be ubiquitous and, and collect data 24 seven, and, and now everything's a sensor that touches a network, even medical devices. So, so you know, when people talk about big data, you've probably all seen this, being, being technologists, it's this thing about, well, it's not just how much of the data there is, it's, uh, what is it, uh, how fast is it coming to us? How fast do we make, need to make decisions around it? And uh, what kind of variety does it have? Is it a medical in image? Is it data coming off of a medical device? Is it a clinical text? Um, is it structured data? So all of this coming together. <clears throat> now, 
and, and it's a big business, and that's why we're all here. I mean, that's, uh, you know, if you go back and reread the 2011 McKinsey Report, um, there is a huge amount of business associated with the value of the data. We talked this morning about the value of the data, being the data becoming a commodity. And so, you know, people want to hold it, and, but the value is in actually sharing it, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So, um, and, if, and in the McKinsey Report, uh, they point out that probably the biggest users and the biggest value of data right now are by discrete manufacturers, you know, Procter & Gamble, uh, Caterpillar, all these big manufacturers are actually the big users of data in a dollar sense. Healthcare is second. I, I expected it to be first, but it, it was second according to this report. Uh, and there's a lack of talent, a lack of skill sets. We were talking at lunch today. Uh, you know, when, when I saw it from a, being a research director at a national lab, I was finding it very difficult to find qualified people in data scientists. They just were very, very difficult. They were swamped, they were taken up by industry and all kinds of uh, pulls on them. Uh, there's not very many qualified ones uh, in this space as it's changing so fast. Um, most of the ones I saw were, were um, Foreign or nationals, or foreign nationals, usually uh, usually China and India, and and in fact, uh, if if all of our students in in the U.S. today in college went into science and technology, it would be less um, than the fraction that are already in science and technology in in either of those countries. So it's not we we've already lost the numbers game, and we'll have to be innovative to be uh, competitive economically. Um, and so, uh, if you want to look at some of the uh, spectrum of skill sets that needs to be applied to, to uh, any mission, and healthcare being one of the most important, it's these type of skill sets. And listed number one under the systems area is sharing and trust. And uh, we found in doing projects for uh, at the National Lab that the number one issue in uh, beginning a discovery process was getting to the data. We, t we heard about it uh, in the prior panel that when there's value in data, people want to hold on to it. But what we have to do is be very innovative, and I'll speak to that a, a little bit, very innovative in trying to convince people there's more value in sharing the data. Okay. Uh, more value to them uh, even if they produce it and hold it. Uh, social media is a, is a big uh, piece of the equation today. Um, data architecture is, is very important in the HIT community. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, sensors, mobile platforms, and how do you make sure that your data system is, uh, is coherent <coughs> and in harmony with the workflow process of the, of the, of the clinics and hospitals. <coughs> data analytics, of course. Uh, you better be good at text analysis because if you're not good at text analysis, uh, you know, in our view, in our experience, uh, the world's going to pass you by. Something is common to, when you put all the data together, something is common, and the common denominator is text. Um, uh, 80 to 90 percent of the uh, text uh, uh, is unstructured, okay, and um, you, we have to be able to deal with it. Um, Multimodality fusion. So uh, we had a number of projects where uh, we were looking at clinical clinical images like uh, mammograms, and we had the associated clinical reports. And you can use classical data fusion techniques uh, and machine learning techniques to actually get earlier indicators of breast cancer than you could with either modality alone. Um, Clock constraints, sometimes these decisions have to be made fast. When they have to be made fast, about the only thing you can do is give somebody your best amount of information you can give them. Try to associate a risk and an uncertainty with it. Um, large scale, of course, you know about geotemporal. Most of the data today has got a geotemporal tag to it. And that, that statement alone has a ton of knowledge tied up in it. And uh, you see more and more uh, discovery of interesting things happening around the fact of, of where, when it was taken and where it was taken or collected. <coughs> and 
and then social networks. Uh, social networks uh, could say big graphs, okay? And if you look at the news in the last week, and what, you know, all the news about the NSA, that's what it is. It's a big graph, and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit. Modeling simulation is really the key to be predictive. I mean, the data is static, it's sitting there, and somehow it's connected. And you've got to figure out how it's connected. And that's a, a model or, or it could be a simulation. And so we, in our business at the laboratory, were hiring a lot of people that were really good at understanding uh, how to do agent-based simulations and discrete event simulations. And what that means is, you know, how, how do you simulate how an individual is going to make a decision and how is he going to communicate that, his actions, or how is it viewed by another person? Um, and then cybersecurity, it has to be part of the equation, otherwise uh, it, it all falls apart. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about sharing and trust. And, this, and, I, and I want to uh, try to make an analogy to the, to the conversation we had before in the panel about the EHR systems wanting to hold their data because it had value associated with it. Um, when 9-11 when happened, uh, so the government said, well, look, we have to have these sensor networks that can detect um, the release of chemical, biological, and nuclear radi radioactive materials. So we want to build these big networks around the country, which they, which they did to some extent. But they wanted to build standards about what, how that data should be collected and stored and analyzed. We were on all the standards committees, there were about seven, and we met for about seven years. Uh, in the meantime, MySpace started, and, and Facebook started, and, and, and so we were just leapfrog the whole standards community was, in some sense, leapfrogged, because um, adoptability was driving everything. Whatever system was being adopted became the standard de facto. So we stopped. Our, our standards approach, we did, the lab did, and we said, look, let's apply, excuse me, let's apply social media principles. They seem to be working. People are sharing data like crazy now. And what are these principles that are, that are uh, helping, in helping them get to a point where they want to share the data? And it's these principles I've listed here. And you know, the main one is, I'll tell you who I can, I want to be able to see my data and, and, I, and I'll get permission from the people uh, I want to see data from. And then you have scoring systems and ranking systems and all, all of the others you see here. So every information platform we started building were built on these <laughs> principles. Principles that encourage people to share data, provided an easy way to get that data, and an easy way to, to work with the data and then get it back out. Um, just like Facebook, okay, Some, same thing. So one of the examples uh, was this one here, um, the Verde Electric Grid st status. Um, the department, this is kind of hard to believe, but the Department of Energy was not allowed to see what the current status of the electric grid was in the country. That was privately held data. Uh, so when a hurricane came through or something happened, they would pick up the phone of friends in the industry and say, what's happening to your lines? We have no idea. Uh, they tell them on a the phone call, they write a report, they get it up to the president and all that stuff. It was, it was unbelievable, just kind of surprising. So um, about that time, we were starting to build these systems based on these social media principles, and we said, okay, um, let's see if we can get Tennessee Valley Authority, that's the big uh, electric uh, utility in, our, in the southeast, if they'll share the data with DOE. And so when we went to them, they said, no, that's proprietary data. So we started trying to think of ways that would be a uh, reason that they would want to share that data in return for some data that we would give them back and, and help them mash up. And we figured that out. We, we give them weather data and population data and other data that they found valuable. And so they said, okay, we'll let you have our, our uh, transmission current and voltage data. You can send it up and put it on a map and do anything you with as long as he, as long as you don't send it to anybody else but DOE. So we did that. That took about an 18 month uh, negotiation. We got it up and within a month 
the rest of the country was sharing their data because they perceived there was some economic advantage to TVA sharing that data. And they said, well, you know, if they're, getting, if they're sharing it, it must be a good reason. We're, we want to share ours too. So then we uh, realized the viral effect of that first person sharing data. So uh, in essence, it's, it's, um, I would challenge this community to think about how do we incentivize uh, an EHR um, provider to, share, to want to share their data. That's their primary business model is to share their data because they're going to get more value out of sharing it than holding it. And um, it can be done. Uh, there's a lot of ways that uh, we can think of doing it. And, and so we started in the process of thinking of ways to incentivize people uh, to share data. And we started building that into our, our business process as well. Right. Um, and there's other applications I've shown. Um, the other thing that's happening and really affects, it's going to affect HIT quite a bit, um, is this idea of data architectures. So, and, and this is what we, I'll show a lot of the work we did for CMS was in this area. And that's the following, you know, data, if you, you can look at it just how you operate your computer from your desktop at home, you don't open up an Excel spreadsheet to see, to see what's happening in the news. You don't, you know, open an Excel spreadsheet to look at YouTube. No, this is coming at you in all ways. And that's how all data is. Healthcare, manufacturing, uh, national security, energy. So for the last 30 years, um, people have been uh, building and using relational databases, SAS and Oracle. Oracle can store a, a, a one billion row by one billion column um, database, okay? And, and, um, and, and operate it in memory, okay? So it takes a big machine, but they can do it. So, they, so what's happened? In the last 30 years, um, scientists and, and technologists have gotten They've been producing more and more ways to efficiently query and retrieve data from databases. You know, it's incredibly fast. Incredi it's remarkable. A lot of ingenuity. Okay, what is Oracle doing today? They're saying, okay, we're going to be bypassed if we don't get on this bandwagon of being able to handle unstructured data. Okay, so, so they have a whole business line. Uh, pointed to that as well. What that means is, is that it, take a picture on your desktop. When you bring a, a, pic, a family photo up, you tag it, right? You say, okay, I'm going to tag it. It's got my brother in it. It's got trees in it. It happened at this date. It happened at this place. Um, I, I don't like the tie I was wearing that day. Whatever you want to tag it. You can tag it. It's all, all, all you want. What that does is it um, really enriches the discovery process. Because now, when you want to discover something, and it has a, uh, about a question or some area, and that tag is relevant to that question or area, it's going to go find that picture. Okay? So what it's taken then is the innovation in how to store the data into innovation of discovery. And what I would think is in the next 10 to 20 years, technologists are going to be learning how to squeeze efficiencies out of, out of that kind of what I call flat file. Just your data is in one big stream. It has tags or also called metadata. Tags or metadata associated with it. And, and it really enhances your capability of finding things. So if I want to find, uh, you know, if eventually if the whole country has uh, EHR data stored somewhere, you want to find the six people in the country who have the exact same medical issues you're having, then, you know, you can find them. It's kind of that kind of thing. So what we've been uh, concentrating on is uh, how, do you, how do you build data architectures like this? Data architectures that are relational databases still, MPP, row-based, column-based, graph-based, and um, so so that's, you know, if you're not good at those terms and you don't know what they mean, uh, you might want to uh, start thinking about them because they're the future. Um, so here's an, I'm going to show three example, 
Well, I, I showed one example. Here's my uh, third example. I showed two examples. So here's one that I think is uh, sort of illustrative of what can happen when you bring disparate data together. Um, we were tasked in 1998 to build a, uh, a world database for population distribution at a one meter by one meter resolution that had never been done before. So you start with the best census data from every country in the world, and then you start looking at, at global images, at um, terrain uh, data, elevation data, uh, economic use data, et cetera. And you build a model saying, okay, uh, I think so many people live in that one kilometer by one kilometer square because there's a lot of lights, they're close to the road, the census is about that much in that region, and you just distribute people. And that became, uh, if you go, go to Ram McNally or National Geographic or anything, you look up population, you'll, it'll reference uh, LandScan. And what, but in uh, 2004, uh, DHS um, started a new project with us to estimate where people are in the daytime, in the nighttime, in the United States on a 90 meter resolution. So 90 meters, that's like this building. You know, how many people are predicted to be here in the daytime and how many people at nighttime? And it, and it fused together uh, uh, population data, road data, railroad data, land use, slope, academic institutions, spawn, uh, prisons, hospitals, business employment imagery. We got every bit of the imagery from uh, NGA, the National Geospatial Agency, okay, for the world. And we're building other databases that actually lead into this data, databases of hospitals, databases of daycare centers, databases of uh, nursing homes, et cetera. And that feeds into our population estimate, but those are valuable data sets on their own. So the story here is, uh, think about any three data sets that you could put your hands on, and whatever they are, and say, okay, what could I infer from those three data sets? What, what are the three other data sets that I could develop if I had those data sets. And, and it's really kind of a fun exercise. I mean, it's, I think we all, would, we all enjoy doing things like that. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's where the game is. Um, it could be called predictive analysis in some sense. You're predicting things that you aren't measuring by inferring, inferring them from a model you built with data that you have. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what you all know very well, but, I, but it sets the stage for, for the rest of the talk. Um, you know, the Open Government Initiative, it's, I, in the course of doing our work, um, you know, we, we were regularly meeting with the uh, CIO of, of the White House, okay? It was Vivek Kundra at the time and Todd Park after that. I guess Todd's the CTO, but anyway. And what they did, they put, they sent out emissary, emissaries uh, to all the agencies, saying, go into that agency, um, you're, be a change agent, crash through their programs, and see to what extent you could uh, encourage them to free up their data. So the one that was assigned to CMS was uh, Vish Sankaran, okay? And uh, uh, we talked on the phone almost every night. And his job was to go in and convince the program owners at CMS that it was to their advantage to free up the data. And there's a lot of resistance, tons of resistance. And I wouldn't claim it's been successful yet, but it's, but it's making progress. They had 65 different data centers. <coughs> their data was uh, difficult to put together and bring into one place, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, data.gov is, you know, of course, you all knew about that, know about that, I'm sure. And so they were marching through all these different agencies and, and application spaces and, of course, um, health sort of. So first thing is it's being digitized. And, you know, I don't know, this is a statistic I got out of HIT News yesterday or the day before that they estimate 30% of the, of, of, uh, of the, um, Providers have, have EHR systems in place now of some kind. 
and then the HIEs that we talked about earlier. Um, meaningful use means dollars, and, and um, that's the challenge. The challenge is, uh, you know, if it doesn't mean dollars, then it's, it's going to be an out. It's going to be a, a, a bad outcome, okay? Because the whole, the whole uh, vision is that we're going to reduce cost. Right? Uh, criteria for meaning, meaningful use have been established. You all probably know what that is, those are. Um, and the health information exchange means the dollars. So it was interesting hearing the, the conversation before and. And um, so I don't know what it means when HIEs include the same population. I mean, it seems like to me that's, that's duplication, stove piping. I, 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 you know, that's for, that's not, not, not uh, I think that's an open question. And, and uh, I think it's a challenge. Uh, in coming forward in the future, and they even alluded to that, saying they don't know how they'll evolve. Um, I don't understand <coughs> why uh, th why there is one data set for every person in the United States against their Social Security number. Most people have Social Security numbers at birth. Yeah, I don't. I don't know the answer to the question. You, you guys may know. I, I just don't know. I don't know why everything isn't associated with the individual. And I'll show something. Uh, of course, ICD-10, it, it's uh, estimates I've seen recently that there's probably, uh, it's probably going to cost a billion dollars nationally to make this transition. Um, and these are the significant challenges. Understanding who exactly owns the data. Well, I, you know, as an individual, I want to own my data. I want to own all of my data. And I want to share it to my advantage. Uh, data capture, storage capacity, search and retrieval, meaningful analytics, information visualization, all these are things that, that uh, you all are talking about every day, I'm sure. But talent is the one that, that I think is, is the, the main national challenge right now, which is good for being in the industry. Um, you know, cloud services, uh, we were starting to use them for our national security customers, okay, and, and they would they had enterprise clouds that, and the nice, the important thing about moving to an enterprise, enterprise cloud is that you can use cloud technologies within your enterprise and you don't have to develop those yourself. I don't know if you've ever, I don't know how many of your systems are tied to systems like uh, SAP and all these others, but they're, you know, it really starts you down a hole when you use those. So, um, <coughs> Uh, you can get not only platforms as a service, it's what we usually tend to think of, but you can actually get software as a service and, and, and um, solutions as a service as well. Um, there's some uh, enterprise uh, cloud uh, services being provided. One of the, one of the um, is it Net Cloud? Uh, Net, Net Standard. Standard. Net Standard is, offers one. Um, but there are also commercial clouds that you can go out to. Amazon's re uh, there's a big show of HHS approving Amazon for their uh, cloud service uh, being HIPAA compliant, and I understand they, they just got their first BAA recently. So um, small businesses, small organizations, this, this, is a very, uh, this is a very reasonable way to go. You try to shift the risk uh, to someone whose business depends on always being at low risk. You're not going to be Amazon. And, let data start leaking and live very long. So, although they have and did, <laughs> they didn't have. Uh, you know, big data architectures. Um, so once you reach a certain point, um, you'll you'll want to have someone. You want to have some people in your staff that know the open source stack for big data. And if you don't know what the open source stack is, then uh, you know, that's something you need to start thinking about, okay? Open source stack uh, for software and what are the commercially viable ways to, to purchase that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about healthcare analytics. I'm going to start out with uh, what we were doing with CMS because that's what I know about and, and then I'll just end up with a couple of things. 
So I work with CMS, which is a, about a $30 million collaboration we had with them, uh, was to work in three tracks. And, and the first track was to do one demonstration project in every business line that they had, okay? And show the value to that uh, program manager of freeing up the data, okay? And so uh, we had uh, projects for uh, a Kent State Medicare pilot where we were harmonizing Medicare, Medicaid data. Uh, and <coughs> we did a pilot with 10 states. Uh, virtual data center consolidation, IDR uh, revalidation, uh, PQRS reports, um, analytics, uh, overpayment recovery analytics. All these had an element of analytics to them. Uh, uh, the geo -Bene -Bene, uh variation, multi-agency data sharing, uh, insurance exchanges, you know, Henry, I forgot his last name. Um, he's, he's the one that was in charge of it all the HIE infrastructure you're seeing, uh, BI tools for state <coughs> care coordination, quality resource use reports, health indicator warehouse data visualization and analysis of any college centers. So um, we, did, we did a, we spent a year, we, did, we built, built up demonstrations. Uh, they gave us three years of all their claims data. So we had uh, all the claims data for all 45 million bennies for 2009, 10, and 11. And so we did our data architectures against that and, and our data uh, analytics against that. Um, but first we had to pull all their data together. And that was uh, what was referred to as an enterprise knowledge discovery infrastructure. It was a knowledge discovery infrastructure whose purpose was to be able to do all kinds of analytics on top of that infrastructure. It was built for analytics. And so, you know, it was built to collect data, organize data, maximize the use of data, which is the analytics part, and then disseminate it. So, uh, we're, finish up, we're finishing up, a, uh, Oak Ridge is finishing up a project now where they're, automa they're automating the, um, the access rules for requesting data so that now if you've, you know, you've got the right permissions, you can type in what data you want. It will <coughs> automate it and it will send the data back to you high speed if you can, if you have those connections or whatever uh, way that they can get it to you that you will need it. Uh, and, and so if you have that high speed connection, you can get that data in seconds. So that's, that's the vision, We're not, they're not there yet. Um, and then, once that infrastructure is sitting there, they wanted to open up that infrastructure for industry engagement. Prior to that, when they wrote an RFP, uh, uh, Congress would mandate a program. They put out an RFP. Some big integrating contractor would win it uh, for $100 million for the next 10 years. And what was happening historically <coughs> was that it was in the integrating contractor's best interest to have no innovation during that period and high maintenance costs. Okay? So they were locked in. There was no way to bring in new technology and without rewriting the contract. And, um, and the maintenance fees were, were eating them alive. And that's, they said, look, we need to break that paradigm. Help us break that paradigm. So what we'd like to do is we'd, we'd like to build an infrastructure that's accessible, and then we'd like to build the equivalent of an app store on top of it. So we did a whole series of demonstrations where we invited small companies and large companies, SAS included, Oracle included, but small companies and one-man garage com companies to come in and access the data and show what they could learn from the data as a demonstration of the value of being able to, to bring a lot of different minds uh, against the problem. So that's what, that's what we did. So here's some examples. Um, this was a healthcare regional status anticipating uh, ACA pay by re region for insurers. Uh, uh, looking at how they how each uh, uh, region, and you can find the regions by zip, by a collection of zip codes, collection of counties by county. There, there's a lot of different ways you could collect that, and then compare it with um, regional, national averages, or any other uh, geographic location you could find. Um, 
expenditures and utilization by uh, demographics, um, uh, provider feedback uh, vignettes from the PQRS and, and QRUR uh, reports. Um, this was the Medicaid 10 state pilot for uh, called TMSIS, um, trying to address the duals problem. And you know, one of the things that, that we were co uh, concentrating on because we've been working in the national security uh, arena was you know how do we how do we look at this from a big graph standpoint to reduce fraud, waste, and abuse. So you know right, this. Uh, here is a topology of the uh, one year of the provider-provider interactions, okay? Just you know, how are all the providers uh, connected? And what are some of the provider Benny relationships? And when we went back, as a case came out in the news and we, we go back and look at the data, it just popped off the screen. Uh, you remember about a year ago, there was a famous fraud case in, in um, Texas, a group of, um, Providers got together and defrauded the CMS on the tune of 380 million or something. Well, that, when you looked at when we when we looked at that data, it was just it just popped off the screen. It was just amazing how clear something like just looking at how people are related to other people, and this is what you're reading about in the papers in the NSA uh, stories today. It's just how are people related? So. We ask ourselves, why, why, are, why, why isn't every individual in the United States a node on a graph? And why aren't all providers in the United States a node on a provider graph? So that we could provide, so that we could exercise the same kind of analytics that has been developed for other national missions like national security and others. Why can't those, those types of um, technologies be applied to the healthcare industry? They should be. They could be, um, but there's a lot of <laughs> uh, a lot of uh, barriers to that. So if you look at uh, well, so now I did, so that's just some examples of what we did for for um, CMS. Um, if you you can hardly pick up a paper today without somebody coming up with a clever use case of what they could do with the data. I bet every one of you in here could say, boy, if I could get the data for this, this, and this, I could do this, this, and this, okay? And these are, these are just some of the bins of them, unwarranted medical procedures, okay? Uh, the data is out there to find that. You just need to figure out how to put, get that data together. Fraud, waste, and abuse, administrative costs, provider inefficiencies, coordinated care, preventable conditions. I, I uh, read um, in maybe uh, people can put more meat to this, but I've read recently that the uh, you know medical errors calls about, is about the third or fourth leading cause of death in, in the United States. Um, administrative costs, the billing process, the coding process, the logistics process, all of that can be viewed in a holistic way. So if you have someone coming into your system and you know historically what their ability and willingness to pay are, and you know some idea of what's gonna to happen to him coming out of, out of the system, how can you bend their collection process in a way that, that's different than somebody who's, who you know is gonna pay or know is covered? Okay. So that all of these are possible. And improving care, of course. Um, Complementing clinical trials with social media. Uh, um, NIH has a number of programs in trying to look at how do they build rigorous complementary sets of, of discovery to the normal clinical trial process. And Oak Ridge had a, a couple of these, one for, one for um, breast cancer and, and another one for uh, colonoscopies. Um, Reduction of medical errors, uh, more successful drug development, data-driven preventive care, consumers of health care, not just patients. So I, as a, I mean, I heard, I heard the expression mentioned today too, is we're going to become consumers. We're going to be able to dictate the price point we're willing to pay in, in the future. And that's the vision. 
So uh, just to, um, I just started a company called PYA Analytics. Uh, we took a group of us that had been doing that uh, work at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, ones that were combining the, CF, the claims and, and EHR records and stuff like that. We took them out and formed a company, and so our focus will be analytics. All right, any questions? Questions in the audience? Don't be shy now. We have one here. Yeah. Hi. That was a great talk. Uh, very nice, nicely done on a very interesting uh, topic. But one, I've heard it said that that um, this uh, many of the topics you're talking about are going to be kind of like the gold rush, you know, of the 1800s. What do you what do you see as the biggest opportunities uh, in all this? These mountains of data that we're all collecting uh, uh, going forward. You know, I know that's a tough question, but any, any ideas on where the domains of, of value well, are? So you know, um, the low hanging fruit so far that I've seen is um, the the simple discovery of uh, uh, across a lot of different issues. Excuse me, by just Having the data shareable and and in one place, you know, hospitals that we've we've uh, uh, interacted with. I mean, why should anyone ever look at an Excel spreadsheet again when you have tools like Tableau? I mean, you should never have to look at a spreadsheet. That's 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 something you know, very very low hanging fruit. Okay. Uh, the other one is just uh, taking the time to look at your enterprise data is something that most people, most organizations don't have. They, oh yeah, we're collecting the data, we have a lot of data, we got bills out, we got, you know, okay, who's analyzing your data? <laughs> Who has time, right? And we saw that in our national uh, security, I mean, our, our uh, federal customers. They say, oh yeah, do all this fancy stuff for us. And we say, great, you know, give it to us. what do you want to, you know, what do you want to look at? What, you know, how oh, we don't have time to help you. So we weren't the domain experts in that particular field. Other people were, uh, but they could not free up their time because they had day jobs. So, so just having someone on your staff dedicated to saying, "Look, look at our data. Just you know, take a cup of coffee. You know, walk outside, leisurely look. Take a couple hours and start looking at the data, and then asking questions. You know, just asking questions." And nobody seems to be doing that. I don't know why. It's just, it's just, it's just an avalanche of data is preventing people from looking at it. Um, so. Oh, I thought you were asking a question. You're no, but I, I can make I can make a comment. <laughs> I can make a comment because you did spur spur a thought. Um, I think one of the things that that um, that we see is that the capability and the tools might be outpacing a competency layer for hospitals to have that analytics competency to harvest, to understand what they have, to continue to mold what they have, to make it more of a knowledge utility so that they can tap it when they need it, and how to manage it, and how to support it, and how to drive it. It seems like the tools are, are coming out so fast, but they're, it's like they're going right over their heads because they haven't, they haven't spent time building the competency layer. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, you know, the, the tools aren't that expensive. There's a lot of open source tools. There's a lot of inexpensive tools. Um, uh, there's huge value in the enterprise data. And so you, you could squeeze out value from your enterprise data for a long time. You just, you could go, I bet each one of you could just come up with a, a question that you would want to ask against the data. Once you've squeezed out the value of your enterprise data, and this is what we did a lot at the lab, then you say, okay, what other data is out there, what other public and private data is out there that I can add to that data and then continue to squeeze value out? Okay. Think of the population, you know. Just get more data and, and get squeeze value out of it. So, so that when I said before, you know, what three data sets could you combine to get something uh, interesting out of, that's, that's uh, that's a challenge. I mean, that's something that we, you know we all should be doing. 
but yeah, you're right. Technology is way ahead of of the talent pool and the time pool. I have a uh, question, um, kind of related to that. Uh, we've gotten very good at collecting and creating big data, um, but as you uh, have indicated understanding the information and sharing it and making sense of something that's actionable. Um, what kind of skill sets do you see or what type of um, people do you see working within our healthcare systems or in the, in the private sector to actually make meaningful use of it? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a common, I think it, and it's hard to find, but it, it's uh, when you find an individual who has some degree of, of, um, of um, awareness of of what tools are available and what kinds of analytics are, uh, are possible. And also knows at least one sliver of the healthcare domain. You know, you know what, is, what is reimbursement audits? You know, what are, what are, how do you do reimbursement audits? You know, where does big data play into that? You know, what other data could be added to that data to squeeze more information out of it? So I, I think to the extent that you can find, you can train people to be at least competent enough in both those areas so that they can look out to the domain side network and find uh, what they need, but they also have enough touch to the technical world, they can look out to the experts in the technical world. Because none of us have, you know, that can span that, that dual, duality across all the, all the domains. Well, have you seen those those skill sets or that experience within that industry and other industries? Yeah. So, what I what I what I what I was kind of surprised by was how far the healthcare industry was behind you know, business finance, business intelligence tools, national security. They're like light years ahead. Uh, even energy um, uh, scientific domains, they they know how to do this. Uh, I think it's just the na nature of the beast and, and the way the data is and the workflows happen in the medical. In my limited experience, I think what I'm seeing and hearing is that you know, we've gathered all this data, we have all this information, we can run all this stuff, and you have to ask your, yourself, so what? And so I think we have to complete the circle and come back to the patient, to the consumer. Now that we have all this information, how is that going to affect the care of the patient? And, and that should be part of the discussion from the very beginning because, you know, you can start getting all excited about your technology and forget your ROI, whether it be financial or, or impact on, on patient care. Absolutely. And if, it's, that, if that's not being integrated from the very first, yeah, you may not ever get there. Another question? Right. And, uh, this makes me uh, think about the, I think it was in Florida where there's two brothers and a sister who build Medicare for $35 million yeah. or something. Yeah. You know, to us in the provider community, when they're going after us for you know, one and two transactions. It just seems a little hard to understand why Medicare can't root those out. Why, that, you, why, was, why is that a problem? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> I could give you my take on it, having dealt with CMS now for two and a half years. Um, so, first of all, it, it, it's built into their pay and chase um, scheme, okay? When we went to them, we said, look, Let's use high performance computing just like the credit card companies do. You know, you put your credit card company, they already know what they've already calculated what they're gonna what the answer's gonna be. It, it, they don't, you know, when you put it in, it doesn't go calculate it until you know. It a no or a yes is sitting in there already. Because they're so they're continually saying, okay, yes, no, yes, no. So the idea was let, rather than pay and chase, uh, let's have some reasonable amount of uh, detection of fraud, waste, and abuse on the front side because but that requires access to all the data all the time and a lot of computing power. So um, 
access to all day all the time was the issue uh, that we've been addressing for the first year and a half. Uh, the quality of the data is really poor. Uh, the reports are continually updated. I guess the average time for um, uh, getting payment on the payment was three iterations, I heard. So, so there's those issues. Yeah. The other thing I, we ran into, so one of the things they asked us to do, said, look, 2009, just go in and see how much overpayment, write a simple algorithm and see how much overpayments we had. So we found 70 million of overpayments. It took us about a few days. Dead people, you know, double, double billing, et cetera. So we thought, man, this is great, $70 million. We said $70 million. It, you know, we, didn't, we got no reply back. And so what we started learning over time is, uh, first of all, um, it gets put in a stack. Is it, do you have all the uh, evidence trail? And is it prosecutable? And does it make the FBI priority list? If it doesn't make that FBI priority list, forget it, you know, just forget it. And a lot of these things were, you know, being taken offshore. Um, you know, what we were told by the FBI was that um, the uh, mafia had, was now predominantly in the healthcare business and more than drugs, okay, because there was more money in it. And in fact, nation states were in, in are here, uh, Russia and others. Um, so, you know, they, they said, well, oh, it's, it comes from that neighborhood and. Brooklyn, well, that's, that's, that's Russia, and, you know, it was almost a joke. So, and then there's the uh, embarrassment factor, you know, the, you know, if you're a program manager and you're supposed to be watching stuff and something happens, you, you get exposed. And so, I, that's too simple of an answer, but I, you know, I think there's all this going on. It, it, it is very, very complex. So the only way CMS treats it is to apply the same rule for everybody, whether it's you as one patient, one provider, uh, audit, or you as, you know, auditing, trying to find the big picture. And, you know, we had a lot of discussion there, you know, they're, they're aware, they're, you know, they're smart people, and they, they know they're missing the boat too. They shouldn't be going after small recovery. They should be looking for big recovery. I, and I don't know if you've seen the estimates, but there was a, there was a paper by Don Berwick in, in uh, last April in JAMA, where he estimated from public uh, from public uh, insurance, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and the VA, that the loss to fraud, waste, and abuse, the low was estimate was 200 billion a year, and the, and the high estimate was 450 billion a year. And when you added in uh, private insurers, the low estimate was 500 billion a year, and the high estimate was 1.2 trillion a year. I mean, these are numbers that's kind of unbelievable because <laughs> they're, they're the same numbers that are being thrown around in our national uh, debt. Discussion. So, but I think the, the, the simple thing is there's a, there is an awareness that something's got to be done, and that is some not. We, and, and they, they are not, uh, they, uh, CMS does what Congress tells them, and they're caught between the political football, and they're, when they have a project, when they had a project with us, we didn't have one project manager, we had 10, and they were calling us every day, you know, like, did you, did you charge us for Cokes the last time we came down, you know, kind of things like, you know, like, look, you know, so they're under tremendous pressure not to waste money, and they have a set of, they have a mindset of things they're gonna do to not do that, and, and um, I'm not saying anything bad about them, it's just the way it is. So if you were going to give uh, free advice to um, private practice physicians and small practices, what would be your first step in diving into analytics uh, using their existing EMRs, um, at least to start get started? What, what would you ask them or advise them to focus on? I would say, you know how to pull out the most important few pieces of data from, from, from your EHR for each patient and take a meaningful look at that data in comparison with your other patients. Okay. Uh, I had this discussion with my physician. He said, he sees 35 patients a day, and I asked him, do you have, do you have any way to look at that patient's historical profile other than you know, the last report before he came? 
And he said, no, I would, I would like to, but I, you know, I don't have that. And uh, so I think a simple thing is just getting the low-hanging fruit out of it, whatever your current e EHR system is. And, it, and if you are in a, in a system and you can harmonize that data, even if it's in another EHR system, you can find ways to harmonize the data. Uh, without being, building a big system, you can build it interoperably. Uh, then you get a lot better, bigger uh, patient pool to uh, look across. And I have yeah, value in that, I think, too. Great. Do we have any other questions from our audience? 